Okay, for the second to last lecture today, we'll have Pavel Safarnov and Hasakhovich shifted to Poisson's work. Thanks. Um, okay, so the plan for my lectures. So, as opposed to other speakers, I'll start with something abstract and move on to uh, something more concrete uh, towards the end. So, I'll start with some uh, just talking about the right of geometry. In the second lecture, uh, I'll talk about some differential geometry, um, how can you use differential geometry on these kind of spaces. On stacks. And finally, in the last lecture, I'll explain, so by differential geometry, I mean like symplectic, Poisson structures and so on, on stacks. And in the last lecture, I'll explain how those uh, like structures give some nice perspectives on some familiar spaces in geometric representation theory. Mm. Then we'll hopefully use the data. Okay, so let me begin uh, by saying a few words about direct algebraic geometry and what it is exactly that I'm talking about. Okay, um, so let's say X is a scheme, or maybe some variety, or maybe just a polynomial equation. Then from this object, it, you can naturally extract a functor. So uh, it defines a functor, which I'll denote by the same letter x from uh, commutus of algebras two sets and in sense commutus of algebra are to the set of r points of x so there are several ways of writing this for instance you can take the affine scheme uh, spec r and palm it into x. Okay, so uh, in, in these lectures, I'll generalize this perspective. I will slightly change the target category, I will slightly change the source category, but the idea is I want to work with functures as geometric objects. So I will define the notion of what is a function on such a space, what is a quasi current sheaf or a vector bundle on such a space, what is a differential form, and what is a symplectic structure. Okay, and let me just uh, draw some, some diagram, the kind of generalized spaces you can consider. So as I said, uh, schemes are roughly speaking um, functors from kind of algebra to sets, but I'm going to generalize this a little bit. So let me explain a more general kinds of spaces. Okay, so you can look at primitives of algebras. Two sets. And this is, um, so a scheme defines a functor. Instead of sets, you can look at uh, more general objects. For instance, you can look at groupoids. So in other words, you're looking at objects which uh, whose points have automorphisms. So here we have a set of points, now we have points which have automorphisms. And the kind of functors you have here, examples are given by stacks. Uh, well, if you have groupoids, why not, why not have higher groupoids? So for instance, in Kinsey groupoids, Well, as you can imagine, the objects that go here are called the Kinsey stacks. Um, 
And uh, I can also generalize the source in the following way. Okay, so I have commuted small algebras, and we've seen today in several talks, we, we can look at commuted small algebras in complexes. So, commuted some DG algebras. And we can consider functors to infinite zero points. And this is the object I'll, I'll be talking about. So examples here will be derived stacks. Okay. So let me. Yeah. When you say examples are derived stacks, do you mean every such arrow is a derived stack? Uh, I'll, I'll say it precisely, extremely precisely today. Okay, so now let me first explain why you might want to generalize from schemes to stacks, so one level. I will not explain why you want to generalize from stacks to infinity stacks, but then I will explain why you want to generalize from infinity stacks to derived stacks. So why these, these kind of generalizations are useful. Okay, let, let me begin with schemes to stacks. So in geometric representation theory, the, the most basic object you study is a variety with the G action, where G is some multiplayer group. And you can encode this data in the following way. Well, we can take the quotient of the variety by the G action. Well, if the G action is not free, this is a terrible space. But this is a great example of a stack, x on g. This variety has natural projection to the point. So x mod g maps to point mod g, which is called bg. OK, so from variety with the g action, I, I can extract a space with a map to bg, or a stack with a map to bg. <coughs> Not to BG. Now let's let's do uh, the converse. Let's start with a stack with a map to BG and extract an object with a G action. We have some stack with a map Y with a map to BG. Well, there's an actual map from point to point mod g. So in other words, bg has a canonical mm. base point. Well, then you can look at uh, y cross point over bg. So in other words, I take the fiber of this map at the canonical base point of BG. Well, just by writing it this in this way, this has an action of base loops on BG. And base loops on BG, that's the same as G. So in this way, from, uh, from a space over BG, I recover a space with a G action. So this, this is the it defines an equivalence between uh, spaces with the G action and spaces over BG. And it turns out that in various generalizations, this perspective is more useful. So you might uh, you, you might look at symplectic structures or Poisson structures on spaces like that, or isotropic structures, quasi-tropic structures, and so on. And it turns out to give some nice explanations for some structures you might see on X. Geocovariant structures or weakly geocovariant structures. I have one question. So you took this full deck of stacks, I guess. Yeah. So uh, why is it clear that what you get is not a stack but even a, a scheme or something? Uh, I, I was not clear on that. Um, if you want to actually get a scheme, you want to put some assumptions on, the, on this map, and this map is represented by schemes. Then the full deck will be a scheme. Okay. Thank you. 
Because so how do we think about stacks again? Okay. So, so for uh, for now, think about stacks as functors on communities of algebras to group lines. And I will define what I mean by a stack x mod g um, later today. But for now, the definition is just like a functor from these functors to group lines. So next. Uh, so in the second lecture, I'll, I'll be talking about chip Poisson structures and chip asymptotic structures. Let me explain why you want to look at chip of things. And this is the idea of kind of verified differential coordination. Okay, so let's say X is uh, a smooth Poisson scheme. And the word Poisson will mean the same as what I will define later, which is a zero triple Poisson scheme. So zero will be the categorical number. Okay, if, if you have a smooth Poisson scheme, the natural thing to do is to consider differential quantization of x. So you can either look at functions, which is a commutative of algebra, in vector spaces, or you can look at the category of sheaves, which is a symmetric quantile category, or in other words, it's a commutative of algebra. Categories. And then differential quantization, what does it do? Well, you deform this commutative kind of algebra to some non algebra. Or you can deform this category. So if you have this differential quantization, you can look at models of differential quantization. This will deform the symmetric monoidal category to another category which does not have any monoidal. By plane, it just means it doesn't have a monoidal structure. Uh, and so, what, what is what I mean by categorified differential quantization? Well, we can think about quasi linear sheaves as being kind of categorification of functions. So, this is again just like functions, it's a kind of algebra, but in categories rather than vector spaces. And so, you can ask what kind of structure you, want, uh, you, can, you can have on X, which would allow you to deform this kind of algebra. To an associative algebra in categories, in other words, to a monoidal category. So the idea uh, is that if X is a one shifted Poisson, um, let's call it snap, then the first quantization. will allow you to deform cosmic sheaves to a monoidal category. <clears throat> okay, so this is the sense in which I mean this is a categorification. And okay, you can also look at higher um, higher shifts. Then if you have a two shift Poisson structure, you get a very monoidal category. And the example to think about here if you take G a simple algebraic group, you can look at the category of representations of the group G. And this has a bright manual deformation to representations of the corner group. So this doesn't immediately look like like quaternary sheaves on a scheme as representations of a group. I, I, I will mention this is the same as quaternary sheaves on the class final stack. So this suggests that 
right there. So this is a break manual handling. It suggests that there, there's some kind of Poisson structure on the classifying stack which controls this deformation. Could you spell out what it means for quantity coherent keys on X to be a punitive algebra proving category? Yeah, so, so this means a symmetric one over category. And the last thing I want to mention is um, is this extension from stacks to the right stacks. Okay, so. Um, the idea is that spaces like EG. Okay, so so, uh, so I want to define Poisson structures or symplectic structures, uh, and for to define Poisson structures or symplectic structures in the space, you need tangent or cotangent bundle. the relevant notion of today. But if you naively try to define a uh, tangent or cotangent bundle in the, the most classical sense of something like BG, you will discover that this is just trivial. So it's the zero bundle. Now, if you think about uh, what is a tangent bundle or what is a cotangent bundle, well, it'll tell you something about deformations of the space. So tangent space, this is something about its infinitesimal deformations. And what this is saying is that there are no interesting infinitesimal deformations for BG. Parent tries back in this form. But instead, what you can consider is instead of tangent bundle, you can look at the tangent complex. That one second. Um, so it's a complex of bundles. And to define this tangent complex, well, again, you, you'll, you'll need to describe the different deformations of the space, but parameterized but not by kinetics of algebra, but by kinetics of DG algebra. So, so this is the introductory part. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, maybe question. So, what? So the tangent bundle, this, this naive one, was trivial. Yeah. So, what is the naive one? Do you take like a spin, you cross it with some test point, and then map it? Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ah. And then the statement is that punk is somehow. More or less the same function you already had. <coughs> yeah. Um, so, okay. Let, let me write something semi-concrete. So you can look at a mapping stack from the stack of the dual numbers <laughs> into BG, and it's on this in computer. 
you can use as a plain stack. But if you use a drive stack, or if you want to play with this epsilon, then this is the same. So let me be begin by giving some definitions of what I mean by drive stack. So I will not be able to give completely uh, precise definitions just because I'll have to use a lot of homotopy theory uh, and I don't want to introduce that. So let, let me just quickly sketch the kind of things I will consider and not return to them again. So instead of uh, considering sets of things parametrized, so sets parametrized things, and my basic object will not be a set, but uh, a space, a topological space, uh, which is the same as an infinity groupoid, or any other model uh, you can think of. So instead of sets of objects, I'll think about infinity groupoid objects. So they'll also remember some homotopies between the objects and so on. And uh, a linear version of this is that instead of a vector space, I will work with complexes. And both of these will not form categories, but they will form intrinsic categories. So this is the kind of homotopy theory that will be in the background, and I will try to sweep it under the rug. And I will not <coughs> again. Okay. All right. So, so let me begin by defining derived free stacks. So let's say K is a field, uh, maybe of character zero. And let's say C out y circles to zero. This is the intrinsic category of um, what you see DG algebras. Uh, concentrated in non-positive commorphal degrees. This is uh, the replacement for my uh, test objects. And my S, I'll denote the intrinsic category of the intrinsic reports. Okay, and then the notion of derived free stack is something that looks kind of easy. So it's, it's a functor of intrinsic categories. From this category of uh, communities of algebras concentrated in positive degrees, uh, two spaces. Okay, and this is uh, my basic geometric object. Okay, I will give examples of direct pre stacks uh, in a second. But let me define some geometric objects on such a functor. So recall that this is supposed to generalize the functor of points perspective on schemes. You can think about a scheme as a functor from the of to sets. Okay, for a scheme, you can define things like functions and quasi-unit sheaves. So I want to define analogs of, of these for, for the right place. Okay. So 
So the example of, of derived precise that we need uh, often is called an affine derived scheme. So you, you can just look at the representable functors. Then a derived affine scheme. <coughs> This is spec R, uh, which is defined um, by saying that the functor on some A <coughs> is the space of maps in Kinnip's functors from. Okay, so I, I take my, uh, this kind of DG algebra and I give you a space. So this is my function. And this is the, the most basic example of the rest of this one. Okay, so what is a function on, on a direct pre stack? So a function on a scheme. Well, um, maybe you don't know what a function on a scheme is yet, but maybe you know what is a function on an affine scheme. So the functions on spec R, this, sh this should be R. And then a scheme is covered by affine schemes, so it, it's a function on a, on a scheme is going to be a collection of functions on each offline, which can be together. And this, this kind of definition generalizes, or can be generalized to the right presets. write it down. So, okay, let me give a definition then. So let's say x is a derived three stack. Then I'll define functions on x to be the limit um, over affine schemes mapping into x of functions. And the whole thing is taking place in this category of CGPs. Okay, so, so what did I write? Uh, so what is this limit being? Yeah, and, and functions on spec R, and again, just R. Um, okay, so, so what is an element of a limit? Well, it means for any affine scheme mapping into X, I'm supposed to give you an element of R. Uh, maybe what's called G. <coughs> um, you have an element of R, which I will denote by F, uh, G pullback of F. And then, if you have two if you have two maps of affine schemes, so let's say you have spec R one mapping to spec R two mapping to X. Let's say this is G. Um, let's call it, uh, let's call it G two H, and the composite is G one. 
then um, you're required that if you take uh, if you take this function, so this is going to be an element of R two. Apply h to that. So, so what is little f? Is that the thing you want to define? Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. F in a function is the following question. So, but now it should be a differential graded thing because you you sort of uh, the, the, the dg on the, the top. this this object is a kind of DG algebra, and now I'm. Uh, writing an element of this kind of DG algebra, and I'm saying an element of this kind of DG algebra is given by the following collection. So, um, okay, so, so for any, um, yeah, so let me, let me just finish the, 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 the thing about composites. So you have a, a G2 pullback of F, which is an element of R2, you apply H. Uh, H is a map from R2 to R1, so if you get an element for R1, and you want this to be equal or homotopic to this element G1, which you have by the first. So again, it's uh, for every affine scheme, you get a function, and they're compatible. This is the same function. So you don't have any proof of the homotopy, right? Yeah, yeah uh, everything else. So, uh, uh, no, uh, usually, um, even though these are connected to CDGAs, uh, you usually take this link in the category of all CDGAs. That's and why it's, it's not necessarily. It's not necessarily connected. I'll give an example uh, <coughs> in five minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, Uh, but, but the thing is that I'm not asking this map to be a cover for any map. Uh, I, I ask for, for a function. So just like if, if you have any map of, from affine scheme to a scheme, you will get a function in that affine scheme. But it's, it's not necessarily an open right. Okay. Maybe like if you actually want to compute it, could you use? Yes. If you actually do computations, you. Yeah, you, you need to do some presentation on the stack. Okay, so the next, uh, yeah, right, so, so this is the algebra of global functions. So in the introduction, I mentioned the category of quasi sheets. Now let me also define them in this context. And I'm going to give more or less the same definition. So I'm just going to copy this. Uh, I'll replace functions by quasi corner sheaves. So I need to know what is a quasi corner sheaf on spec R. In classical operator geometry, this is the same as the R module. So I'll take this as, as my definition and then write this limit. Quasi-linear sheaves on spec R, I will define them to be um, mod R, which is the intrinsic category of DGR modules, unbounded, and then take a limit in the same way. So this is the intrinsic category of quasi-linear sheaves. So let me give a few examples. 
of uh, the right three stacks, what their functions are, and what this intrinsic category is. Um, it's just the relative tense product, except it's a direct relative tense product. Okay. okay so um, first of all, let let me say the following. If X is a scheme, it defines a direct free stack. So a priori, uh, this functor for a scheme is only defined for um, for ordinary continuous authors, not for DG authors. But there is some abstract way of, of doing that. The idea is that if you have an outline scheme, where you know how to define a derived free stack. Um, because you can, if you have an ordinary continuous algebra, in particular it's a DG algebra, kind of DG algebra, so this definition makes sense. And then this works uh, for an instance. So there, there are fully faithful embedding of schemes into derived free stacks. Okay. A non trivial example would be. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, maybe we'll see what, what the functions are in Cosmic Machines. Um, so if, if, if you have X a scheme, then this is a Kavitas of algebra, Kavitas of DG algebra, whose cohomology is the same as. That's cheap cohomology of X, or cheap cohomology of the structure cheap X. You also have this category of quasi kernel sheaves that I defined here. Well, this is an infinity category. From an infinity category, I can extract uh, an ordinary category just by forgetting about uh, all homogeneous, so they connect components of all mapping spaces. So, this is a homogeneous category of this infinity category. And this is the derived category of X. That bonded direct So, so the next example I want to give is the quotient three stack. Um, so let's say G is um, some group scheme and X is a G scheme. Then you can define a certain simplicial scheme So this is going to be a simplicial scheme. Uh, it's zero simplices are just given by x. One simplices are given by g cos x, which has two maps to x. It has the action map, action of g on x, or just progression. And then take the nerve of this action group loop, so we have g cos g cos x, and we have three, three maps, one of them is multiplication, and so on. Okay, so you have this simplicial scheme. So in other words, it's a diagram for 
from uh, from the opposite of the simplex category into the category of schemes. Is the, <coughs> is the naive quotient just truncating this? And then taking this over? Yeah, so, so you, you can look at the quotient in terms of sets, uh, then you can compute literally the same coordinate in the category of sets, so that's going to be naive. Instead of uh, derived pre stacks, you can first of all look at infinity pre stacks uh, where you, your sources can use algebras instead of using GG algebras. And then, you, if you want to truncate that, you can uh, consider the value of the data sets. Okay. So now let me uh, explain what a function and question achieves on this object. Okay, so functions, well, that's going to be a huge alpha which computes group homology. All functions on S. Uh, just when you first squeeze to, let's see, that one. Okay, so functions on S is an explored for the dimension of G. You can compute group homology. And uh, again, the whole of the category of in the so that's not G. This is the G covariant direct neighbor. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the, an important example will be when you take a point like me. Coming back to Aaron's question, uh, if, if you look at this complex, well, this complex is constrained in positive degrees. It's not the same. Okay. okay, so next I want to define the notion of a cotangent bundle of such an object. So, So let me begin with just ordinary schemes and maybe even affine schemes. So let's say X is an affine scheme. So what is a cotangent bundle? Um, it, it satisfies a certain universal property that I'm going to write uh, right now. So uh, Cotangent bundle or the module of KL differentials, um, omega 1 of x, is an R module such that for any M, um, which is not an R module, Maps from Kähler differentials to M in the category of R modules uh, is naturally equivalent to derivations from R to M. Okay, so the module of Kähler differentials by definition represents derivations. So, so far we um, don't know what derivations mean in the, in the derived context, but I want to take this as, as my definition of a cotangent bundle of a stack. So I want to define what I mean by derivations. So let me define a square zero extension. So this is called square zero extension. R by 
M. So again, R is going to be sub algebra, and M is an, is an R module. To be R plus M as a vector space, uh, we do a polynomial multiplication. We can have R1 and 1 multiply R2 and 2. So that's going to be R1, R2. And then you apply the action R1 and 2 plus R2 and 1. Okay, so this is a square zero section of R by M, and this is a complete small term. So let me observe, or let me do this as an exercise, that you can identify derivations from R to M as maps in Kennedy's algebras from R to the square zero extension, and here I'm looking at Kennedy's algebras with a fixed map to R. So this uh, square zero extension has a natural map to R, just give me the web for getting about M. And what is this isomorphism? <coughs> Well, if I have a derivation, let's call it D, I'm going to send to a home, which sends R to R and the derivation. And then this, uh, multi this the multiplication of the square zero extension will close the line square. Okay, so I'm going to take this the right hand side as my notion of derivations, and I can extend this to, uh, to the right side. Okay, so we'll let X be a direct piece stack. Then the Cartagian complex is a certain <coughs> object. Uh, this is an object L, L sub x, so this is the bulge phase L. So it's an object of the category of cosmic sheaves on x. Which satisfies the following universal policy. So for every uh, map from an outline, and uh, any M, which is an R module. So R is some um, kind of GG algebra, and I'm looking at modules which are also uh, concentrated in non positive degrees, just like R. You have the following isomorphism um, maps from this maps from the pullback of the Cartagian complex. So the pullback to the outline. So this is now an R module. M. So I want this to be the same derivations, and as derivations, I will take the, the definition to the right hand side. So I want this to be the same as maps um, let me write like this. Uh, let's, let's write it. So let's call this spec R by S. Maps in the right pre stacks. So in Kennedy's algebras, you have a map to R. So, it, so in pre stacks, it's contravariant, so I'll have a map from S. Uh, 
and then I'll have spec of the zero extension. Okay, so, so if if X is an ordinary affine scheme and R is an ordinary commutative algebra, then this definition reduces to um, this combined decimal. <coughs> okay, so, so here I, what, what I've said is that uh, you have a direct free stack and you find an object which satisfies a certain universal property. Let me know that this object might not exist. <clears throat> so, so there's no guarantee that this um, representing object actually exists. But for nice stacks, it actually does. So let me write an imprecise theorem. Uh, if, a is a, if x is a nice uh, derived free stack, complex exists. And instead of uh, giving a precise definition, a definition of what nice means, let me give an example. So the first example is x is a scheme. The scheme is nice. And the second example is you have a scheme with a g action, so you can take the quotient. If G is some group scheme, and X is a G scheme, and then X not G is nice. Is this for an RP stack? Sorry? Do you exist for an RP stack? Uh, yes, this is true for any RP stack. And this is for an RP stack? This one? Is this for nice or is it for a group scheme? Uh, well, the way I'm thinking about this theorem is that this is true for any geometric stack, uh, so for the Arden stack. Um, uh, there, are, there, are more, there are more examples of stacks that uh, meet a good angle competition, not for Could we see an example of two? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to do, uh, write down uh, a computation of the good angle in a second. Okay. So, um, okay, so here I define just uh, the quadrantic complex of X. There's also, if M is a map of the right pre stacks, <coughs> there's a notion of relative quadrantic complex and uh, there's a there's a fiber sequence on quadrantic complexes, which is if you have quadrantic complex on Y, you can pull it back to X. If you think about this as one forms, well, if you have one form on Y, you can pull it back to X. You have the pullback map, and then this projects to the relative quadrantic. There are some other tools to compute quadrantic complex, but it is not. But let, let me give examples of the quadrantic complex. So first of all, let's say X is a smooth scheme. 
as I mentioned, you can consider schemes as examples of derived pre stacks. So you can try to compute this quadratic complex. Well, then this quadratic complex is actually isomorphic to what you think of as the quadratic bundle of x, which is actually a vector bundle. Scheme. Uh, maybe not. Let's just say arbitrary scheme. Then, in general, H naught of the quadrantic complex um, is the quadrantic bundle uh, or quadrantic sheet. I wish I knew just uh, one or two differentials. But in general, it has more homologies than non positive degrees. And finally, if you have a scheme with a group action, um, let me put some, you know, let's say G is some group scheme, and X is a smooth G scheme. Okay, so what, what am I supposed to give you? Um, I'm supposed to give you a quadrantic complex, which is an object of the category of quasi sheaves. Now, quasi sheaves on X and G. Recall that this was uh, the category of G equivariant complexes of quasi sheaves. The complex of x one g, which is an object here. For this, I need to give you an um, a g current complex of the Does this okay? Occasionally, require two different assumptions. Uh, depending what you mean by the right hand side. This is going to have the quadrantic complex of x, which is the quadrantic bundle in degree zero. And this is a J-covariant vector bundle in x. So it's, it's going to be a two-term complex. And then in degree one, it will have G-dual as, um, as a three-wall vector bundle. And this map is the dual of the action map. The okay, so so some example is uh, the case when x is a point, so just the cross time stack. So in this case, uh, the quadrantic complex is going to be a G representation. And this geo representation is just a quadrant representation in degree plus one. So, in particular, it's homology, which is a naive uh, quadrant bundle, is zero. In this sense, you don't see any, classically, you would not see any kind of kernel of the quadrant bundle.
other question. <laughs> <laughs> so, could you explain again? So, what did it have a cover of a stack? Is there some general limit that you can write down that gives us a hint of how to actually complete this within the complex? I mean, you've given us answers, right? Well, l let me say something how. Roughly speaking, let me give a partial answer and then if you want, I can tell you something else. Um, so, the idea is that if you have uh, a portion stack, you can try to write down this fiber sequence that I mentioned down here. So, you'll have go back to the cobounding complex, cobounding complex of X, and then cobounding complex of X relative to X1G. So this tells you what is the covariant complex, at least as a complex of sheaves on X. Well, if the covariant complex on X is equal to zero, and in degree one, it's the relative covariant complex of X to H1G. Mm -hmm. Now this guy, uh, th there's another tool, which is covariant complex for pullbacks, how they behave under pullbacks. This is, um, using that tool, you identify this with the But you can just think about X to H1G as a free sport bundle. There's something more general you can say for general stats, but yeah, more complicated. Yeah. 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 Yeah.